Hello and welcome to Media Whores. I'm Cora and today <sighs> uh, Today we'll be reviewing <sighs> uh, I need someone with more energy to say this. Thank you, Yako. Today we'll be reviewing the 2008 Andromeda Strain miniseries, based loosely on the novel by Michael Crichton. So let's pop a couple Benadryl and caffeine pills as I throw this to the round table. Look, we know that I normally take notes when we watch something. My notes for this consist of variations of the word boring. I just have one thing to say. During the first half of this, we were all slightly buzzed, except for Cora, who doesn't drink. We made it through the first half via liberal doses of alcohol and, in Cora's case, coffee. In the second half, we actually had to distract ourselves by doing other things. I was reading Green Lantern Rebirth for the dozenth time. Pick it up! I had to play Golden Sun to stay awake. I actually just kept rereading the Wikipedia entry on this very series. This is boring as hell. I, I think part of the issue is the lack of an audience surrogate. In the case of the scenes that take place in the lab, all we get are ridiculous, over-the-top medical explanations for everything that's occurring, and even the actors don't seem that interested. Hell, House doesn't have half the pseudo-medical nonsense that this show has. It doesn't help that when they do have serious revelations and plot developments, you aren't aware of it because the actors deliver the lines in the same bland, boring, dull monotone that sounds like they're delivering a Burger King menu. Maybe it has elastic qualities we don't know about. For now, let's assume this is Andromeda. Bill and Charlene, you check the pathology of this thing, see if you can figure out how it kills. Dr. Noyce, you examine our survivors. Find out what kept them alive, Dr. Chu. You and I will test the black substance and Andromeda for what conditions each likes and dislikes. See if we can't ID their nature and their structure. Of course, that's assuming that there is actually a revelation occurring. Most of the time, we were just sitting around waiting for something to happen. The writing is just atrocious. The Andromeda strain is a sulfur-based microorganism. That's an element that was present in the novel, but I didn't remember that at first because I last read the novel in elementary school. The book actually presents this element in a way that catches people's attention without disrupting their suspension of disbelief. The miniseries was far less tactful when presenting that info, and all of us called bullshit on it. Andromeda doesn't have DNA. What is it, some kind of prion? No proteins, not even any amino acids. But you're making the assumption that they want to follow Crichton's goal of being medically and scientifically realistic. This clearly was not true when they said acidosis has to do with how much stomach acid you have. But it's not like the baby was knocking back handfuls of acetylsalicylic acid. No, but Tobler said she was always crying. She was colicky. If Sylvie breathed rapidly long enough, carbon dioxide would build up in her system and she would become acidotic. So you're saying they survived Andromeda because they have the same level of stomach acid? That's brilliant. We actually have a doctor present, and I'd like to check to see what his views on that statement are. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. I don't think he approves. The thing is, acidosis has to do with the pH levels of the blood. It has nothing to do with stomach acid. They're saying that the baby's crying raised its blood acid level, but I'm pretty certain that should actually be the other way around. Before this, I didn't know what acidosis was, so I asked. Then I facepalmed. Now, I will say there was actually one subplot that was more engaging than the rest. That was the side story with Eric McCormick, you know, Will from Will and Grace. And it's strange that his plot was more interesting because he did absolutely nothing. 
He didn't even expose the truth about what the military was up to, which I thought he was going to do. There's actually a scene which makes me question his intelligence. He's been running from the military for most of the second half of the miniseries. Then he sees a group of military choppers passing overhead. So what's his first thought? Uh, let's wait them down and see if they can come get us. What the hell? Sign your own death warrant, my friend. Well, I, I didn't like the presentation of the virus. In the novel, it never actually became all that widespread. In the miniseries, it keeps mutating and changing beyond the parameters that they set out. Uh, the problem is that they hardly acknowledge it, so it makes it feel like the characters are either lying to us or just don't care. They said it can't be spread from a corpse of one specimen to a living one. And then when it happens, they're completely ambivalent. That actually happens at the end of the first part, and I was like, wait, why are you seeing this? It's not important, it can't spread through corpses. And they're like, we're wrong! No! You lose all credibility for your heroes like that! It would have been handled well if they had said, what if it evolves? And then we see the transfer. Uh, the miniseries starts when a probe crashes in Utah. Two kids pick it up and bring it into town, and, you know, the military comes to collect it, and they find that the town is filled with corpses, and they themselves end up dying. A team of researchers then goes in and finds that the only survivors were a baby and an old man. This is one of two segments where I was actually interested in what the researchers were doing. Because they were DOING SOMETHING! Oh, um, yeah, they were out in the field looking around and, you know, doing things. None of the characters were actually that engaging, but at least what was going on was somewhat interesting. Uh, they bring the baby and the old man back to the facility, and we're introduced to a who's who gives a crap of researchers. Honestly, I didn't remember any of their names, because I never cared about them. The only one I remember, I remember by his real name, because I saw him in something much better. Sai Chu, played by Daniel Day Kim. I remember much better from Hawaii Five-O, the remake. I had a nickname for everyone so I could keep him sorted. There was Black Doctor, guy I've seen a lot of stuff that, but can never remember his name, Red Shirt, chick who shouldn't be a scientist, and there was Sai Chu. He was the only one who I can actually remember because his name was so out there. There was the guy played by Benjamin Pratt. Benjamin Pratt? Who did he play? The main character. There was a main character? Yeah, he's the guy whose name I can't remember. There's also Krista Miller, yeah, she used to play Jordan on Scrubs. If our really important choices could be sampled like a box of chocolates, then our decisions would lose their meaning. What would be at stake? That may have been the most bored I've ever been whilst someone was talking to me. After the researchers get to the facility, the virus begins to spread and they begin to discover things about it. The researchers are working under the command of General Mancheck, and he's the only character whose name I actually remember, because it's an awesome name. Uh, he's played by Andre Brower, and you know what, Brower? You're better than this. <sighs> anyway, once the virus starts spreading, there's actually some really weird stuff that goes on with that. They display it in the form of a red haze. At first, we just assumed that this was a way to show the viewer how the virus was spreading. However, characters actually start running from it. And it spreads faster than logic dictates it should, but screw it. You know, it, screw logic! There's so much wrong with the presentation here. Can I have one more logical fallacy that pissed me off? At one point, there is a group of soldiers wearing full body protection. The kind you would wear if you were going into Afghanistan to fight terrorists. And they're attacked by a flock of poorly CGI'd birds. I hardly think a few birds are going to bring about the end of the world. All of the soldiers died. This armor is gauged to protect them from assault rifles and chemical weapons. All of the soldiers died. If one had died, I could concede that maybe one bird ripped the suit. No. All of them died. Apparently their suits are made of paper mache. Okay, I, I do want to try and briefly explain what the Andromeda strain is in the series. In the novel, it was a form of virus from outer space. 
In the miniseries, it's apparently a virus from the future which can communicate amongst its parts, understand human communication, and human weapons. It actually triggers a nuclear detonation to allow it to spread as fast as it did. And not only is it from the future, it's also a paradox. Ugh. Yes, the virus is a paradox. It has no origination point. If it had never come back from the future, it would have never existed. You see, in the future, the virus broke out across the planet, but humanity no longer had the bacteria that were necessary to kill Andromeda. So they put it into a probe and sent it through a wormhole so that it could land in the present when the bacteria still exists. We then have the events of the miniseries, where the strain is dealt with using the bacteria. The U.S. Army keeps the sample, however, and it's implied that the sample will cause the outbreak in the future, causing the U.S. to send it back through a wormhole so that... And now for something completely different. Let's talk about the cure for a second. The cure for the virus is Bacillus infernus. It's a type of bacteria that lives in thermal vents. It can't exist anywhere but the thermal vents. And it's anaerobic, so even if it could potentially survive on the surface, it wouldn't survive in open air. I believe it's called an extremophile, which means it needs an extreme environment to survive. And that reminds me, how did they deliver it? They airdrop it. They fly in a straight line over the infected zone and airdrop this extremophile to clear a circular infected zone. Bull. It's bull because the writers trapped themselves. They spent so much time expanding what it was capable of, they wrote themselves into a corner and had to come up with some bullshit way to eliminate it. Speaking of bull, there's another piece of bull here. The capsule that the virus arrived in was sent from the future and contained a computer code, specifically ASCII. This is how they found out about Bacillus and Furnus. It also contained a series of numbers and symbols. Spoilers, if you care. The numbers are the lot number that America will use for when they store the virus in the space station in the future. The symbol is the symbol we put on the bottom of the container. Why? Why did we need to know this? Why did you waste your time coding this crap and sending it back to the past when you could have given more realistic solutions than bacteria that cannot exist on the surface of the planet? Okay, I I'm not actually trying to make a big deal about comparing it to the book. Uh, as a teenager, I was a big Michael Crichton fan, but this was one of my least favorite works of his. You know, it was one of Crichton's earliest novels, and he didn't know how to write a resolution to save his life. Well, in that regard, the miniseries was actually similar to the book. The ending was so abrupt, I felt like it came out of fucking nowhere. Well, let's talk about that ending for a second. They give us this bullshit moral lesson. We should advance science, but we should be careful because shit could go wrong. Yeah! That's science! You take risks to learn things! Don't try to scare people into not inventing! Hell! To put it simply, humankind cannot gain anything without first giving something in return. To obtain, something of equal value must be lost. I don't necessarily disagree with the moral of the miniseries. Uh, science advances faster than our ability to stay morally responsible for it. But the way they present this lesson is just idiotic. It's a fucking afterthought. There's a lot that isn't conveyed well in the miniseries. The 1971 film was handled far better. Hell, Jurassic Park 3 might actually have been handled better. There, the explanations might be stupid, but at least they're provided. There's a plot point that came up early on, and we all said it would come up later. In their base, there's a nuke, which will destroy the base if there's a containment breach to prevent the virus from getting out. They should have disabled it when they discovered that Andromeda grows exponentially when it gets irradiated. Now, I do know that in the novel, they didn't find out about its growth until towards the end, and therefore they had to rush to try and disable the nuke. But in the miniseries, they found out about it at the halfway point. Here's the deal. I predicted perfectly how this plot was going to go when we were first introduced to these elements. Almost every part of my prediction was correct. 
I guess I sort of liked it when Sai Chu waded into the radioactive water to cut off the guy's thumb and throw it up so that the thumbprint could be used to disable the system. Thumbs way up. He threw it more than 20 feet in the air, but the guy had no trouble catching it. And by the time he caught the thumb, everyone should have died of radiation poisoning. Okay, we haven't said much about the characters, but the real reason is that with the exception of Jack Nash, you know, Eric McCormick's character, none of them were distinctive in any way. Actually, he was only interesting because he was running around doing stuff. It was frustrating how un interesting these characters were. I mean, I've stated that one of the primary downsides of watching a series is that you're committing to watching far more footage than a movie. We just barely got through this, and it's only three hours. It is extremely dull. I mean, there's no feeling of impact with any of the events in this story. There's just no justifiable reason to watch it. I've seen worse effects, and the actors did what they could, but they were working with the horrific horrific script. Uh, part of me would like to give it a lower rating because it was extremely boring, but I'm going to give it 3 out of 10. Uh, that's a turd blossom. It had a few redeeming qualities, but it is not worth watching. I've seen more three-dimensional characters on highway billboards. There were two, maybe three lines of dialogue that I enjoyed. With all the seemingly unnecessary subplots, there was so much padding and dialogue, I don't remember more than 20 minutes of this miniseries. What I do remember still makes me annoyed at how pointless it is. The concept seems interesting when you start it off, but it doesn't take you long to realize how boring this series will be. You'll probably wake up not really remembering what happened for the past three hours, but I didn't actually drop the show, so I can't give it lower than a turd blossom. The opening scenes were interesting, but when they start to explain without actually explaining, that's when they lost me. So, I'm giving it a turd blossom. <sighs> I think you guys are being way too generous. I felt that at times this miniseries was out to insult my intelligence, because they somehow succeeded in dumbing down their plot while making it extremely convoluted. The effects were... eh. There were no characters, they gave us generic cutouts that we were supposed to relate to. As for the actual execution, it was an ungodly level of boring. The pacing was miserable, and watching it was beyond painful. The only reason I sat through it was because it's my duty as a reviewer. I'm giving this blasphemy as a film the lowest rating I've given anything. I'm giving it a 2 out of 10. Why have you forsaken me? Why? And just on a closing note, Bull. Well, with two turd blossoms and one why have you forsaken me, the media horse consensus is... Turd blossom. Well, with that strain over, let's move on to the final target of our TV block.